Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee, <laughs> which has a lot of foam. I actually didn't hit the uh, liquid part yet. Let's try one more time. There we go. Mm -hmm. The 2% might be working. I'm getting used to it. I told David that I don't like the oat milk. I said, turns out I don't like oat milk. And he goes, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. He bought it for me anyway. But uh, yeah, clearly he was dubious. So guess what day it is today, kids? It's Friday. Yay. It is Friday, May 14th. Uh, here we are at the Ides of May tomorrow. And uh, yeah, got an exciting show for you today. Actually, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be fun if I could say things like that, though? If I were like a real or real podcast. Uh, but you guys are listening so clearly. You love me just the way I am. Let's see. Um, before I forget, because I have been forgetting all week because I am a sucky friend. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dorinda's new release, which came out Tuesday. <laughs> I forgot on Tuesday. Then I don't do the podcast Wednesday. And I'd made a note for myself on Thursday and I still forgot, but I remember today. So congratulations, Dorinda, on the release of The Grave Digger Son. It's a novella in her immensely popular, much loved Charlie Davidson world. And it actually hurt, hit, hurt, hit number 33 in the Kindle store overall. Overall, not just the Subcats people, but overall. So um, she doesn't need my little shout out. She's rocking and a rolling. Uh, so yeah, that was really cool. She was very happy about it. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys go go check it out. I, I haven't read it, but um, I've read pieces of it. And I was um, working with her. No tandem writing when she wrote it. And so I know some things about it. And uh, yeah, she's, um, I think it might be a good entree to her world. I Don't quote me on that. But if you don't want to read all 13 Charlie books, you might try the novella and see what you think. Um, I read some, some bits, you know, she's always so damn funny. <laughs> so it's funny and sexy. And it's about killing demons. What more could a girl want? Clearly nothing. It reminds me, because this is on my mind, uh, we watched the movie Thunder Force the other night with uh, Melissa McCarthy and Octavia Spencer. And it's on um, Netflix. I know it was one of our subscription services. Free quotation mark. Uh, and it was so funny. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. It was a great spin on the, uh, you know, middle-aged ladies becoming superheroes. <laughs> but for some reason, you know, and, and I think Melissa McCarthy's so freaking funny anyway. And Octavia Spencer does a great job of playing against her as the uh, very serious nerdy scientist. But there's this scene where... Melissa McCarthy is trying to get some message across and Octavia Spencer just is like spent her whole life in the lab and she doesn't do anything that's not perfectly serious. And uh, I can't remember what Melissa McCarthy was getting at with this. She was talking about one of Jodie Foster's roles and she's like, no, no, not Tay in the wind, Jodie Foster. <laughs> and, and Octavia Spencer has no idea what she's talking about, but her daughter, her teenage daughter does, and the daughter's just cracking up. And for some reason, I woke up this morning thinking about that. Not Tay in the wind, Jodie Foster. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I recommend that movie. It uh, predictably has low ratings from all of the IMDb neckbeards who are so mad that Melissa McCarthy gets to make movies. 
Uh, but for everybody else who's like not a neckbeard, I think you would enjoy this movie. I, I used my extra foamer to try to make up for the fact that I don't have a half and half in here. And it's, um, it's a little extra foamy, even for this extra foam girl. Today's earrings, aren't they pretty? These were for a while, my favorite earrings. I wore them everywhere. I bought them here in Santa Fe, but before I moved to Santa Fe. So they are silver danglies on theme. And they are, there's a sacred spiral hanging from a hook and then a long dangling teardrop shape. Um, so elongated, you might not call it a teardrop. I'd say, but it, but it is. It's if you took a teardrop and drew it out to its maximum length. And then there's a little bit of turquoise on the end. I bought them here at the Indian market. And for those of you who have listened to the story of how we ended up in Santa Fe, uh, I bought them here on that work trip right before David and I decided to move here. So they've always felt like they had a bit of extra, extra sparkly energy for me. And uh, yeah, there was a time when I wore them nonstop. And I didn't stop liking them. They just got supplanted by other favorites. But I I do. And now that I can see them, <laughs> now I can see all my earrings. I really have been wearing all of my earrings a lot more. So that uh, jewelry cabinet has been the best thing. Thank you, Mom. Let's see. So yesterday I talked a lot about subgenre thing. And we've been having... Um, ongoing conversations on it on a couple of my author loops uh, <laughs> I, I want to make sure to get his name right um, well I, I won't say who it is a famous author uh, but on one of my loops um, well Ellen Datlow made the comment that uh, she wasn't fond of the trend of putting punk after other things like cyberpunk, you know, once cyberpunk was done and I said, oh my God, this is like one of my things. It just drives me crazy that people put punk on the end of all kinds of things like that, like that's a thing. And a lot of times it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense to me at all. And not if you, you know, like cyberpunk made sense, but you know, adding punk onto other things just to make it sound cool doesn't. And um, a couple other people weighed in. Sage Walker agreed because she is my bestie also. And then um, we'll just say uh, Ty. You guys will recognize his name if you are fairly in the know. Um, maybe I, I, I think it's Ty Frank. I just didn't want to get his name wrong. But anyway, he weighed in and he said, um, he's like, uh, you guys realize that complaining about punk being added to things makes it no longer cool is in itself incredibly punk. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, you're right. So I've been laughing about that much better than uh, people being wrong on the internet. It's been amusing conversations. So anyway, one thing that I wanted to, uh, a mini story to tell you guys about is that someone had weighed in when we were talking about subgenres and how do you define them and uh, high fantasy versus low fantasy and all of these things. And <clears throat> one person had said that, that this conversation basically came down to taxonomy and that it wasn't really productive, that it wasn't useful to get into this haggling over taxon, what amounted to taxonomy. And a couple of us came back and said, no, you're wrong, <laughs> because it really matters to up and coming authors. It matters to self-publishers because when you self-publish, you have the opportunity to choose your Amazon categories and your keywords. And that this is not a um, 
it's not it's not a frivolous decision it's not golly gee whiz and successful authors ones who have already made it big and have really big platforms don't necessarily get this because they're not in the trenches trying to get eyes on their work uh, but being able to wield the tools of Amazon keywords and categories can make a huge difference at the same time and I've talked about this on here is you don't want to just put your category put your book into any category or subcat just because you think you could score high in it rank high in it and there are people who do this and there are rumors that Amazon is going to start cleaning this up we can only hope but this is why if you look at some cat subcategories like if you are looking at I don't know I, I ghosts and angels okay there's like a subcategory for ghosts and angels why they're together I don't know they might not even be I might have just pulled that out of my ass but you know what I'm saying and then you see a book by um, some self-published thriller writer you know like the night that the skeletons took revenge not making fun of that if you guys Kareen would probably love a, a story like that but it doesn't belong well actually I may have just screwed myself it could kind of belong in ghosts and angels you guys know what I mean if it's something that really really doesn't belong so um, you know like if that were put in Amish romance and it has nothing to do with with Amish romance but it's in there because there are these tools and I use them where you can look at and see how many books you have to sell to get in the top 100 or top 10 of a subcategory and some subcategories you don't need to sell very many books to get that high end so you get more visibility right but that doesn't mean that you are connecting with readers in the right way um, as an aside something that Kareen has been complaining about is apparently somebody is giving this advice out there with author newsletters to put re in the subject line r e colon and then the subject because then it appears as if they are replying to you and granted they may be doing this to try to get their newsletters past the spam filters but she and she is not the only reader uh, perceives it as an attempt to to trick the reader into thinking that they are that it's a reply and some people categorize their emails differently by whether or not it's a reply right so the thing is is if you were trying to trick people into reading your book or reading about your book then consider that you are not building a healthy relationship with your readers um, why are you trying to do what you're doing if if you feel like this is the thing to do is that you are desperate enough that you need to trick people into reading about your book then maybe you need to go back to the book um, and you know the thing is is we are all in that boat we all want discoverability we all want to get eyes on our books um, either reading about them or actually reading them and <laughs> tricking people is just not the way to do it that just makes you a scam artist I'm sorry that's you know and maybe you're at peace with that but then you'll have to be at peace with the consequences how's that so anyway taxonomy um, we were making the point that it does matter that it does matter very much um, because having your book show up in the right category and reach the right readers who will then be so happy that they found your book that's everything that's what you want and then I didn't add in but I was thinking about it um, I was going to tell you <laughs> an interesting story on how taxonomy matters and I will warn you we are going into the neurophysiology weeds here but um, when I was in grad school working on my PhD in neurophys I worked on bats and for those of you who remember your high school biology you were called that there is the whole system of taxonomy right so kingdom 
let's see, it's um, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species are the big ones. You know how I remember that? Do you guys remember the the uh, mnemonic for that? It's um, King Philip calls out for good service. <laughs> but I always forget which the which king it's supposed to be. I always want to say King George, which then messes me up. Kingdom of Phylum. So anyway, and, and you guys remember those charts, right? Where they're broken out, then they split and they split. And there's all sorts of, again, subcategorizations with each and within each. So bats are Choroptera, which means hand wing, because the bat wing is actually an extension of what would be our hand with the webbing in between. So the bats have the elbow connected and then the big webbed part, that's the hand there, the hand wing, cure optera, cure being hand, optera being flight. And like helicopter, right? So you get your little science lesson today. So within Choroptera, there are two sub orders. I think that's an order. And it is, those are mega Choroptera and micro Choroptera. Okay. Mega Choroptera are the old world bats, um, the fruit bats. And we call them the old world bats because they don't uh, occur in like North and South America. They're all over in the uh, South Pacific, India, Eurasia. In fact, I think Asia, I don't even think Eurasia, but all, all down it, especially in that South Pacific area in India. Fruit bats, right? You go, you know, and they're cute, right? Big, big eyes. Um, perhaps through no fault of their own involved in our recent global pandemic. And there's a reason for that. We can talk about that too. So mega Choroptera, big bats. Then there are the micro Choroptera. Micro Choroptera are in both the new and the old world. Um, but we call them the new world bats. And those are the small bats that you are mostly familiar with. The insectivores, uh, they, you know, fly around at night and use uh, sound, echolocation, and so forth. So mega Choroptera and micro Choroptera. The reason that these two if you put them side by side, they're very different looking animals. And the reason that they are in the same order, two sub parts of the same order, is that the argument has always been that the same kind of flight could not evolve twice. That they must have a common ancestor because you're not going to get the development of that hand wing um, miraculously happened twice in two different parts of the world. You, you may discuss this among yourselves because the thing is, is that the mega Choroptrans have a notable, and this was decided quite a long time ago when the original taxonomy was done, like 1800s, I think. So the thing is, is in the mega Choropterans brain and a fruit bat's brain, they have binocular vision like primates do. They have the neural pathways that cross over. Uh, right eye goes to the left side, left eye goes to the right side, like people do, like all primates do, like only primates do. It's what gives us our binocular vision, which makes primates unusual in the animal kingdom. So mega Choropterans probably should actually be in with primates. They are much more like primates than they are like the micro Choropterans, the insectivores, which share, you know, like a common ancestor with like shrews and stuff. You know, and of course, if you go far back enough, there, there's a common, you know, we go all go back to the same single cell, right? But it's, it's an interesting question of taxonomy because the taxonomy is misleading. Probably the fruit bats should be in with like the 
the lemurs and the prosimians. It's only because of that hand wing and the argument that the same kind of flight couldn't evolve twice that they ended up with in this taxonomic designation that is probably incorrect and misleading. So that's my story about how subcategories and taxonomy actually matter. And I don't know if they'll change it. There have been a lot of people who've been arguing, like since I was in grad school, so for quite a long time now, that um, the megacoroptin should not be in Coroptera at all. But then people get very upset about that. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because there's the whole concept of Occam's razor, that the simplest explanation is the most likely one, right? And so people want to apply that to things like that the same method of flight can't evolve twice. But why can't it? If it evolved once, why can't it evolve twice in different parts of the world? You decide. On that note, I will remind you that First Cup of Coffee is part of the Frolic Media Podcast Network, and you will find more podcasts you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I will talk to you on Monday. Take care. Bye-bye.